So, um, where should we start? Should we start with, uh, I've got a question or you've got a question or what, what would you, did you, I hadn't given format any thought here, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to just dig in, but uh, you might have a certain way you like to do things. Uh, how about I introduce you first? Would that be okay? And then... Yeah, um, yeah, I'm an English guy, been living in Sweden for 20 years, work as a Spanish teacher, been interested in anthroposophy or Steiner for since uh, 1994, so 29 years. That's great. And I see you also, you are also a blogger, you maintain um, and quite an active blog. Away with um, the yeah, that's right. It's, uh, that was my, I used to work, I used to have my own uh, company. So I worked as a trainer, corporate trainer over here in Sweden for many years. And that was my company. And now I've just, I got rid of all the old stuff and it's just become a blog where I, I write stuff. But I wouldn't say I'm that active. You've just caught me in an active phase. I, I really wanted to dig into out of window, but um, I... Yeah, perhaps I'm. I'm. I would say I'm more active on uh, on YouTube actually on, on on my channel. And and I know in our email conversations we discussed about um, your most recent articles that you wrote, mm -hmm. Rudolf Steiner's and Sri Arbindo's work. Um, before finding the comparisons, I was wondering if you could uh, discuss some core ideas of both individually uh, of R Rudolf Steiner's philosophy. Mm -hmm. freedom, and then we can move on to Sri Aurobindo's uh, Life Divine. What are some of the core ideas that stood out for you? In that philosophy? Yeah. Um, so in, in the world of uh, anthroposophy, Stein, a spiritual science, you can use those three terms uh, in, interchangeably. So th there's what that Steiner talk, uh, talks about. Um, how often he does this. He wrote a book called The Philosophy of Freedom in 1894. And he said that all of the spiritual science that came out, so like these esoteric understandings are where I'm finding so much overlap with Aurobindo, um, that they are all to be found in their like seed-like state within the philosophy of freedom. Um, so <clears throat> there's this is an impulse that, um, you could, some people will argue it's not taken seriously enough. Stein insists time and time and time again that this is the, should we call it the, the, the royal path or the safest path into, um, into knowledge of what he calls high worlds, worlds, spiritual worlds. Um, and that was actually where I, I made my first uh, discovery because the, the first articles I wrote was what was it, it was something like uh, uh, Stein and Aurobindo theory of knowledge because what uh, what's going on in this philosophy of freedom it's he is um, tackling the question of epistemology a theory of knowledge how do we know the things that we know um where where does knowledge start and i happened to re be reading uh out of window because we were doing a series on meta psychology there was three psychologists um who were trying to dis uh, talk about um transformation it's like self-transformation spiritual transformation Although uh, in the series, they never got around to that. They just ended up talking about the theories in psychology and why it was a little bit doomed. Um, but one of the guys in there, he, he started uh, talking really interestingly about our window and so like, this division of nature up into uh, four realms. In, in anthroposophy, we call it, it's like you've got the physical, the etheric, which is the life forces. It's like the astral, which is, uh, is sort of the first realm of the... Um, it is the spiritual realm it's that which gives sentient life sentient life as opposed to m mechanical life if you like and then you've got the eye which is like the um it's the birthing of the purusha something like that is, is it similar to what gets traditionally referred to as self in the eastern philosophy uh yeah i ishvara i think is might be um how uh Arabindo uses it because one of the things that i've noticed with Arabindo, there's 
there's lots of terms there so i haven't got a like a full grasp on how he uses what when because there's like uh, and I've read a lot of the I've read the Upanishads many times, so some of these terms I'm familiar with. Um, so there's there's a term Purusha, and you you've got. Please correct me if I say something that you know better. Okay, but you uh, the way I understand it, you've got this this idea of Purusha. There's like the cosmic Purusha, and there's the Purusha that's that's in us. It's that it's not uh, that which thinks. It's that by which uh thinking is possible it's not that which sees is that w by which seeing is possible i don't know if you recognize these it's like ideas from the um from the Upanishads, and that's really what uh stein is referring to as this 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 i but we have a um just it, it is the mind of arabindo as opposed to the super mind you know it's it's a restricted version of what we what we truly are and so like in in in, in steiner's world this uh, I'll, I'll i'll call it I'll, um true eye because that's the terminology we use often in, in anthroposophy so the true eye it's like never actually fully incarnates it's so like it's we are a reflection of that being and it's like it's you can talk about it's it's consciousness having a worldly experience but it's never fully uh in, in that experience just um I've, I've sorry i've already said a lot and i feel as if i'm not sure i've to what extent i've even begun to answer your your question which was about the texts i wrote um do you want to follow up with a question or shall i carry on with theory of knowledge yeah, sure. By the way, I just want to mention that I, I do also relate to what you uh, uh, said about um, the words like Pusha. Like I have also noticed while reading Life uh, Divine, like some words uh, can, and some words feel like they are repeated, but they are um, different words, but they are kind of like same uh, concept. Yeah. So it can be a bit uh, like when, when you're reading as a new um philosophy like it's it can be confusing yeah absolutely and and the same thing happens in stein as like this etheric body gets like it's get it gets different names because what they're trying to do is capture it's like different essences of what to us is still something foreign it's like it, con conceptually it's still foreign to us so we need words to help us like grow a grow a concept of it rather than it being defined from the beginning we're invited to to do certain exercises as in so like ways to look at the world ways to think about the world so that we can enrich our understanding of what what a concept is so coming i will, I will let you continue sharing four ideas of rudolf steiner one of the thing that you just mentioned was about those um, layers of consciousness um, a physical layer etheric layer and beyond uh, and what are some other core i guess do you feel like his work kind of um keeps coming back to mm. so so one of the things another one that i find extremely interesting and this was actually how i came into contact with your content because you had a you had a round table discussion i think you were six people where you were talking about arabindo and nietzsche and so that is the, the superman and this so nietzsche is so like a corrupted uh super mind really it's a, like it's something that stills like it, it's it's a birth product of it's like a truly materialistic thinking whereas when i read uh, out of indo's description of it this was this was i would call it it's like true darwinism in the sense that it's a full uh a full recognition of the evolution not just of physical beings but us as spiritual beings within nature um and out of window so talks about how we are he, he i love this it's his, his his use of words like really caught me it's like he talks about monkey mind and he talks about mind and he talks about super mind and he's like he, he invites us to like go back to a time when when uh, monkeys were supposedly like beginning to transform to into like this human beings and 
could they could they even begin to understand like what voyage they were it's like em embarking on and of course they couldn't it was like it was it was a natural evolution but Albino and Steiner are both saying we are at a uh, point in time and this is a long period of time I'm not talking about like right now but it's like humanity is is at, at this inflection point where we have uh if we choose it, we have the opportunity to reacquire that which we lost um before and, and even Aurobindo, he he mentions like the Hebrew picture of the fall. Um, I'm not sure what other I can't remember what other pictures he uses in his text, but this idea that we uh, Sacharinanda so like deliberately so like stepped out of itself um, so that it could recognize itself and come back to itself in full consciousness. And it's that idea that I see being it's like uh, conceptually I see that as being identical to what Steiner was describing, that we are, in essence, spiritual beings. We've forgotten about that. And as our window says, we've forgotten it for a good reason. We unfortunately we've forgotten <laughs> we've forgotten the reason why we why we incarnate. What is the value of let's uh, losing a motive, motive word. What is the value of suffering? How does suffering help us to learn about like the deeper aspects of nature? Um, so I, I see I, I see that going on with Aurobindo and Steiner. And again, in Aurobindo, I'm taken by the clarity of the thought around that. Um, but it's like it's uh, it's similar. You know, we like different uh, we like different music because it's like. They might be expressing slightly similar things, but they do it in very different ways or poetry or whatever it is. But you recognize that it's like a heart. They're driving at the same message. They use different ways to express it. And that adds a richness to conversation around that. So you don't end up sounding like a Steiner bot or a or an Aurobindo bot or a Nietzsche bot or whoever, whoever the bot is that you've chosen. Um, uh, yeah, so it adds to that richness, and um, you you might have noticed yourself as you've uh, gone deeper into Aurobindo that you find it a lot easier to connect with other, uh, or so to understand a lot quicker, it's like other complex systems. I don't know. I'm going to make up one now, but you can give me something. Perhaps perhaps something like the Kabbalah. You've looked into it, and you're just like. A, Oh yeah, I recognise that. Yeah, I recognise that. And that, but that's only a fruit of all the hard work that you've put in, in learning about how to bingo in in depth is um is a guess I would make. Yeah, it's very interesting you brought up that idea. Of, um, I've noticed that even in Madame Blavatsky's work, uh, Secret Doctrine, this idea of return to the uh, non-matter. Uh, it's um it's prevalent in like I, I I'm still reading Secret Doctrine. It's a heavy read. Yeah. <laughs> so each page for me it's taking so long, um. But that that's one of the themes I discovered in her work. So it's very fascinating to see that, um, even from Eastern world, Sri Arvindo, um, Rudolf Steiner, um, Madame Blavatsky. So many some of these thought leaders are kind of quite. Uh, pointing to the same thing. Absolutely. It's, it's a little bit like this Aldous actually the perennial philosophy. There is there is a truth at the heart of it. And you've got loads of people describing it from different angles. Some people are exceptionally clear and they they allow you that they invite you to understand more readily than than other people. But yes, there are there are lots of people talking about where where is this truth? Where how do I find it? Um, and what I love about these, um, particularly some of these um, philosophers, um, Rudolf Steiner, Sri Arvindo, Madame Blavatsky, is that they go so much in depth capturing nuances about some of these things that are so hard to describe. Uh, yeah. it's, it's incredible. It, it is. And uh, you've, um, you've reminded me of... Uh, something so particularly this is one difference um and you again please correct me if i say anything that's not true about Arabinda because i'm still extremely limited on his thinking 
Um, but one of the things that I find so deeply fascinating about what Stein is presenting is this evolution of consciousness. He's, he's mapping it out. It, when I say mapping it out, what he like invites us, so, um, like I was reading a recent um, like series of uh, conferences where he was talking about it's like the, the changing consciousness, so like in 500 year period, just in Europe, it's like how how that has changed but he also gives us it's like goes back further into um how it's like greek thinking was fundamentally different but he even talks about the phases in that it's like how they were moving from like a more a, 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 uh, an atavistic clairvoyant consciousness to us like more it's like down to earth and then back into the Egyptian, and then the periods before that in, in, in Anthroposophy become the, um, what do you call it, the Persian and the Indian um, period. Uh, and the, the Indian period is, is particularly interesting because as uh, somebody interested in Anthroposophy, it, it invites you to connect with the Upanishads, uh, the Vedas, uh, Vedanta, uh, uh, this whole um this whole rich world of thinking around um yeah what was this life thing all about why are we here what are we doing what are we doing here um and my my understanding of Aurobindo so far is that that it's like this really detailed and, and point looking at all of the uh the evidence that's out there that supports it's like in the um, in the myths, the mythologies of these peoples, and but also worldly events, how these all it's like uh, can be can support like this evolution of consciousness idea that's so central to Steiner, but also very central to uh, Aurobindo. But uh, you might know more there than than I do on that front. Do you know? Is there is there much? I'm still learning. Uh, I'm I'm also mm -hmm. and. Some of these concepts are so much to um, on. It takes a while to absorb them. But overall, that's, I've noticed that theme across Sri Aurobindo, Rudolf Steiner, but also like beyond these two philosophers, I've noticed this theme of one of the core milestones seems to be um, that I identif recognition of the true I. Um, yeah. That. <laughs> that seems like one of the big um, breakthrough into this realm um, because until then it's a lot of that gets absorbed uh, kind of like bo boxed in the regu regular mind where it's yeah. it has tended to group everything into good bad labeling different concepts so until um, that completely kind of like um, gets seen through uh, it's um, it's it's very tricky to read these books because um, then it it kind of renders into like a conceptual framework rather than uh, out of something living and growing. Yeah. 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 And and that's so, why. It's... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. You go ahead. I, 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 I'll say what I was going to say afterwards. I, I feel I interrupted you. Sorry. No, I, I was uh, wrapping it up. The, um, so th that that seems like one the main um, invitation by all these um, different philosophers to um, kind of graduate from the mind uh, that is identified with the physical body to the true I. Um, yeah, yeah, and 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 uh, so taking that idea, so like uh, it's like at a, a deep, deeper level. So like if if this true I. If we are this like this true spiritual eye, it's like, and we we um, have no problem. Uh, in actual fact, we expect there to be reincarnation. There has to be reincarnation if we're essentially spiritual beings, and we're coming back here. It's like what ha, what have we been learning in the past, and how has it like led us to where we are now, and where is it taking us uh, in the future? So reincarnation which can sometimes feel like like a, a, a slapped on like a, a concept model it becomes an integral part like if we are spiritual beings then i mean it's not it's not it's it's an obvious necessity it, it couldn't be any other way um so 
I mean, like there's there's a, a series of this uh, this eight book, and there's a lot more than this, but this this eight specific lecture series called Karmic Relationships, the eight volumes of it, where Steiner does like this research into uh, karmic relationships, like mapping people's like through different lives, but also talking about the process of. Uh, reincarnation it's like through these di different um, periods so this is one of the reasons why I'm like strongly drawn to someone like Steiner because it feels like what's there in the history books it is being is being brought to life it's like in a completely um, in a completely new way and so you, you're able you don't have to reject the findings of it's like of the world out there you just, like, you take them on and go Oh yeah! Wow. <laughs> so like, yeah, it's like, they become they become richer, more integral, and you 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 see new um, you see new connections that you wouldn't have seen before. Uh, so it, it it invites you to study and to to understand the world more. So. Yeah, absolutely. And as you um, get more into that study, um, one one more idea, and I would love to get your thoughts on it. One more idea that um, the, uh, a lot of these philosophers seem to discuss is the idea of um, archetypes in our psyche, um, in our collective, yeah. <laughs> and the dominance of these archetypal um, figures that can have a role in our thinking. It's it's very interesting to me. Uh, and, and, and I, mm, go. you you wrote something about that, so I was going to ask you about it. So, I was uh, the reason we couldn't talk last week was actually I was in another town in Yana, uh, in Sweden, in a place called Yana, and I've got a very good friend there who's he's a practicing Buddhist, and we were having some wonderful conversations, and we were just, like reflecting on some of the difference between Buddhism and uh, in anthroposophy, um, and it was one of the things that was it was really interesting in talking to him. I I was I was asking him. Um, so in the in the world of uh, in the world of anthroposophy, we don't talk about archetypes. We talk about beings. So is because so, archetypes um, is it they are it's like words for the same things. But when it becomes a being, it's something that sort of like when you let it into you. Or when it comes into you uninvited as well, uh, of course, that's, that's a possibility. Uh, then it has a real um, effect on it could be your thinking, your feeling or your willing life. So like it's like it, it, it enters you and can change you. Um, so. In that sense, it's something that's living because an archetype can doesn't necessarily need to mean that, but it can sound this like this dead abstract sort of like thing in itself out there. It's got nothing to do with me. Whereas there's this very clear idea that these are, there are real beings, just like we are real beings. It's like conscious. We are it's like little balls of consciousness. Let's call ourselves. Um, and what happens? Why do we have the thoughts, the the feeling, and the will life that we do? Well, it's we these these beings are living in us. Um, it's it's like it, it's a a fundamental position within um, anthroposophical thinking. And then this whole notion of it's like purification, uh, it's like the, the cleaning of the mind, that's also so prevalent in in Aurobindo. Um, uh, becomes an obvious necessity because you want to get, do your best to make sure these are good, healthy beings that are entering you and not uh, not destructive ones. Um, and one of the things I noticed about my uh, my Buddhist friend, he was talking much more in terms of processes. In, in Buddhism, they tend to talk about processes, which to me has, and, and this is a personal thing, I'm not saying that's is how it is, but to me that's also feels like it's a little bit this abstract archetype it's out there it's got mm, it's got something to do with me don't know how that type of thing whereas a being that you invite in or it all makes its way into you it's like some for me personally has that it's like 
it has this greater impact that it's if a being enters you it's going to it's going to have have an effect on you uh, just one one final thought on this little thread of uh, conversation i uh this is going back about four or five months or so now but um uh, jonathan one of the guys that uh that does some work with me on the channel we did a video i think it's called the exceptional state uh, sticking your head in in an ant's nest and this was like taken from it's like a, 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 a conference that uh, or a lecture that Steiner gave and he said that when you begin to enter consciously into the spiritual world it's like sticking a head in an ant's nest because everything is alive and your job is to maintain your own integrity not lose yourself in all of this activity that's around there that we lose ourselves into like every night when we fall asleep we lose consciousness there if we move into this spiritual world we begin to experience at a direct level how these are real beings and they are trying to it's like move and shape our thinking feeling our inner lives as, as it were sorry that was a long long answer to <laughs> to uh, archetypes uh, no that that was great uh, and yeah, the consciousness um, in our regular living, we think that I'm awake now, I go to sleep at night, but um, in, in within consciousness, it's all, there's a single thread that goes through the waking state, sleeping state, and deep sleep. So it's it's always active, always being. Yeah, that's right. But we are not always there with our daytime eye consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, the, one more thing I wanted to ask about archetypal um, experiences was, um, and I saw this idea also discussed a lot by Carl Jung. Um, mm -hmm. where he speaks a lot about that, where um, especially during these times of a lot of them are seem to point to the written to non-matter where um, this concept of um, changing like the change in the, like so far when we were deeply ingrained in materialistic world, uh, we had different types of archetypes that were dominating our psyche. So um, he talks about like how during the return, there, there is change in those inner uh, ideas of archetypes. It um, it starts dismantling like some of the archetypes that were very they come across as uh, leaders and heroes. Um, it could change significantly during the return half. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, that's right. And I sorry, go. I just want, I was going to add that, and that can be experienced at an individual level as well as collective level, where it makes come across as a chaos that all. Um, I'll let you add, uh, share your thoughts. Uh, I yeah. No. Have you have you like dug into the red book a little bit of uh, Carl Jung? I haven't. I uh, that's another um, author I want to go deep into. Uh, he has some fascinating ideas. Perhaps um, I, I'll talk about that, but just coming back to archetypes and linking it to uh, Carl Jung, because he's this one of the things he's best known for. I think one of the ways in which archetypes are hugely uh, interesting is that it's like if we, if we look at our soul being as opposed to our spirit being, then the archetype is the reality because it's just what we experience within ourselves. So in, in that sense, I can I can fully get on board with how how Jung um, is talking about the uh, archetypes as the soul experiences that we all have and that we can we can generalize out uh, what they are but where I think he it doesn't um, where he falls short of Aurobindo and Steiner, for example, is that he's not recognizing the spiritual beings that are behind these archetypal phenomena, that these are real beings that are changing, changing us or uh, can change us if we let them do so. Um, but the Red Book is a deeply fascinating book by Jung because 
he he went through um he went through this midlife crisis he's like he's this highly respected psychologist he's trying to do uh psychology he's like in an extremely materialist uh culture um but it's like trying to maintain that the soul is more than so like just uh, uh an electro biochemical uh reaction um and in he, I can't remember how old he was when this happened, but this predates the huge slaughters. So he had all of these visions of how it's like humanity. It's like ripping itself apart, tearing itself apart. And he wrote those all down in the Red Book. And they, I believe they were first published after his death. He didn't want this coming out and having to deal with it whilst he was alive because it was too, how can I put it? It was actually evidence of spiritual worlds as opposed to just soul worlds. That would be how I would describe it, at least. Um, but he, he recognised that he was seeing, he was basically seeing the future. And then he went on to see it's like the, the carnage of the uh, First World War and the Second World War. How, um, how the old archetypes, to use his, his language, the old ways of like understanding the world we're actually going to end up tearing the world apart and this is very similar to it's like Nietzsche of course they they had as like a profound understanding and feeling relationship to what happens when uh, the foundation of a society it's like a, a religious society it's like Europe had been so like a, a religious culture for it's like best part of 2000 years and suddenly this new powerful, extremely powerful tool called science, it's like says, yeah, that whole God thing, spirit was, that's an illusion. And what that means, it's, it's like, it's like ripping the rug out from under so like the whole of humanity, because they've got to start asking the questions. Okay, what's the point of life? I mean, when you when you lived in a religious culture like that, you've got answers to these uh, deep meaning of life questions. You might not always go along with it, but it's like you it's like society has a function. It knows what it's trying to achieve type of thing. Whereas as materialism uh, became ever stronger, these sensitive souls that, that they were picking up on, that's like this, uh, unless humanity can find a new God that will unite them, if you like. Um, rather than a, a materialism which is like based in consumerism and consumerism and power over others and all these type of things, the, the inevitable result is, uh, to use a biblical expression, so a, a war of all against all. We're, we're, we're not there yet, but we can already begin to feel a little bit that this, this unity... Um, I don't want to get into like politics here, but it's like a sense of unity that I would say um, connected together. It's like the 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 Western world because that's the world that I know. Um, at, at a values level, thirty years ago, more or less, this is uh, to a large extent it's uh, evaporated. I mean, in the institutions, in the politicians, how 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 the media works. Um, so yeah, Jung is very interesting in that respect that he had these own experiences, which really it's like can't be explained. They can't be explained with just archetypes, but he preferred to keep that under wraps. Um, and, uh, uh, I could certainly understand why <laughs> not, not an easy topic to talk about with a load of materialists around you. Yeah. Especially he was surrounded with a lot of scientific focused people who are talking about this can kind of alienate him yeah. uh, from the system. Yeah. But science doesn't necessarily, because this is also one of the things that people can um, feel confused about with, uh, with Stein, for example, he, talk, he calls anthroposophy spiritual science. And so like for most people, that's, that's an oxymoron. Spiritual can't be science. But I think what people are doing is they're one of the things they're doing is they're automatically assuming certain um, things that axioms of the scientific paradigm that we live in now 
as being like the ultimate truth and spiritual research just can't enter into that because the only real thing is material whereas what steiner is uh, is getting at is that no 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 science is a methodical like investigation of the phenomena which then generates it's like a, a deeper understanding of what life is all about so if you start all, all your science with saying the only thing real is atoms then yes yeah, so like you've already there's there's if if you believe in soul and spirit um and you're convinced they are you're never going to be able to uh convince these materialists that they actually exist so science is one of these tricky words it's um i heard it described once as um uh, what was it called um jingle jangle a jingle jangle problem um science has two distinct meanings in uh in in the way we use it and we often conflate it into this one word so we never know whether we're talking about the product of science which is knowledge or actually it's like the method of investigation of like honest inquiry into like trying to get steps closer to the truth i mean it's easy to understand why this get conflated but actually they're very two very different aspects of uh, of this greater question what is truth yeah and also sri arbindo seems to do a good job in pointing out the way science is practiced it's based on like empirical model so um, and so what if that model itself is kind of broken that assumption that just because it happens to the majority of people that's the truth so that that's a good question that he raises in life view yeah and and i was just before we started talking i was just listening to an old there's a, a chapter is it chapter 25 yeah it's uh, the chapter where he's it's called the triple transformation and um, he, he said something really interesting there related to what you're talking about. And he talks about how important it is to separate. He uses the word, uh, uh, it's like activity of the Purusha. It's like, it's like a strong, f because we tend to mix Purusha and Prakriti together in our everyday lives. Um, and not really, so like he's, he talks about the importance of, it's like in our moments of meditation, contemplation, but also it's like in, in it's like perception of the world to separate these two aspects out that there is this thinking being um, that is uh, that is making sense of the world. And then there's a world there to be made sense of. And if this thinking being doesn't develop, it's like a clarity of thought in, in his or her mind, then this this world this prakriti which is is it's like permeated by the intelligence of uh, uh of Persia, it will never be seen so we've got this responsibility here but and and this comes also extremely close to the philosophy of freedom with with steiner because he emphasizes he will say something along the, the lines of perception is nothing I'm, I'm paraphrasing him, but it's the essence of it, perception is nothing without thinking. Uh, uh, and and uh, this, this obvious statement, which is actually, if you begin to um, think about it seriously and let it work on you, this idea that there is not one thing that we can say about the world and life and anything, or even about ourselves, without thinking then you begin to like think whoa hold on that's uh, <laughs> that's being that's thinking this activity of thinking uh, and this is a direct quote uh, i live by the grace of thinking if i did not think i would not know i lived i might live but just like i don't know i'm alive when i'm sleeping do you know what i mean is it and, and he's he's really getting us to separate out these two these two realities that we live in and as we separate them out, it becomes clearer so to what extent this is a this is a free activity that uh, that we have to make sense of the world, 
but the, the world is real as well and we can live in illusions in, 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 in the world of our mind as well. So we, we need reality to meet up and start to test is our thinking actually based in reality or is it based in something that is yeah, illusory? Which sort of lift that veil of thinking on being more clearly. Yeah. 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 And and this is um if I if I uh, a little plug for 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 my channel, right? My channel is called the exceptional state, and this is a technical term that Steiner uses in the philosophy of freedom. Um and he's he he's saying that we use tool we use sorry we use thinking as a tool to understand the world that's obvious what we seldom do is think about what is this activity thinking that's working in us and so when we start to think about this activity itself not the product but the thinking itself then we are actually already there engaging in a spiritual activity which ultimately um, moves us closer to the to the threshold or the lifting of the veil where we understand how we are not understand but also experience directly how we are um, spiritual beings yeah i resonate a lot with that and when in initial phases when you start noticing that it really it's a big step in um, not going on an autopilot and stepping off a bit uh, and it's a beautiful um, step uh, in, uh, that can unfold in one's life where you stop falling into that autopilot programming. Yeah, actually, you mind? That's one of the questions I actually wanted to ask you about. So I'm I'm very cognizant of like all of the different types of practices that there are in anthroposophy, for us like lifting the veil, crossing the threshold, this type of thing, the type of things that, that the mental exercises that you can do, so the purification exercises that you do. But um, there's one thing I haven't found. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I, I haven't, and I haven't looked actively in out of window. Perhaps you could tell me a little bit about how, yeah, to, how, how you how you see that question. What's what's the essence of, of practice for you from separating these two out so you get a clarity about these two essential poles of life with practice i think can we um it it can be very tricky because sometimes um if a person gets addicted to practice that can further put them yeah. on some kind of a program that this practice is going to lead me uh to that state of mind um yeah. so it's very um, hard to say because sometimes it may work, sometimes it may not. Um, uh, and there are so many different variations. It's, uh, and that's the interesting part about this type of work. There is no like one size fits all. Um, you can see many variations, like some people meditate for 30 years and still nothing happens. And some people listen to a conversation and it clicks instantly. It's and and vice versa. For some, it, it may practice may lead to that opening. So there are so many different variations, and that's why that's why this is beyond thinking because this is something only that person would know um, in their inner being. Like, what's the path for them? Exactly. Um, it is about exactly. It's this inner path. I, I've got to, I've got to make my own path. But it's it's it it helps you to like read about other people's own experiences, the practices that, uh, that it, for my, in my particular instance that Steiner suggests, but I'm also looking at, I look, look at a lot of other people and it's like try to use that to inform it's like my, my evolving um, meditative life. It's, um, it's, it's, it's got to, at least in, in the way I perceive it, it's something that has to be kept alive. It, it can't, become a rote practice because then it, it dies there has, you, we have to invent ourselves with these creative forces ways of maintaining life so that the process can can move forward yeah and that's again here we can see like why empirical model 
may not fit in because just because it's happened it works for majority of people doesn't mean it will work for you uh, and that you were reminding me of uh, arjuna's conversation with krishna and uh, uh, uh arjuna he, you know the bhagavad gita Arjuna's not so sold on the idea of reincarnation at this stage. And uh, Krishna says to him, <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, obviously, again, um, but says something along the lines of, look, keep on trying, keep on trying, because the fruits, whatever you do achieve in this life, that will be your starting time point next time round. And so for me, what you just described is also an inevitable com um an inevitable consequence of really imbibing what what reincarnation means in practice it's obvious that if there are certain people that were initiated in earlier, earlier lives when they reconnect with that at whatever stage of the life 20 30 40 years of life for them it is like turning a light on because they've done all of the work before or most of it whereas uh, some of us <laughs> me for example Absolutely, I'm, 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 I'm really battling, but at the back of my mind is also a realization. It's like whatever struggles that I'm going through in my own development now, they aren't lost. They are always that's that becomes the starting point, which is, I mean, if we were talking about learning mathematics or language, we would always use that as an explanatory model for why, how, how it works. And it's the same in life. It is, it is no difference. Oh, sorry, there is no difference, at least in, in the way I can see it. It's a slightly more complex, but um, it, 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 at essence, it's the same idea. Yeah, and it's interesting what you just mentioned. Um, Madam Blavatsky, she kind of touches upon that idea in um, uh, in Secret Doctrine, or at least that was my interpretation of what she was trying to express. She talks about this, like we are used to taking the objective world uh, as for granted that we all agree upon certain truths uh, and that's how it is. And we don't even question that. We, uh, we kind of like subconsciously agree upon that. So this growth, and she she's referring to this not at an individual level, but also at a collective level, where going out of the phase, this objective phase into a subjective, uh, maturing in from objective phases to a subjective reality and th that that growth like it can be a bit vague and confusing yeah. and ex also experiencing that as a world where we are in a way we see that where we all now have kind of our own subjective world um, we don't really yeah. agree on mainstream news anymore uh, yeah. <laughs> that th those growing pains of moving on from subjective phase to, uh, sorry, objective phase to a subjective reality, um, and that also kind of um, reflects similar uh, ideas where uh, it's, it can be like a prescription that meditate 30 minutes a day and this will happen. Yeah. It's very interesting how a lot of these ideas have been discussed um, both at a at an individual level as well as collective level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so th threading in, building on your conversation there. Um, in 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 Steiner, we find how um, you talk about. Um, these influences that you're that you're talking about as they're guiding us forward to uh, our window uses the the terms like truth consciousness which i think is is really interesting because this is so the, if we look at the original impulse of science it was it's like moving away from dogmatic assumptions about how the world is to so like say no let's investigate the world and really so let's see how it is like moving away from this dogmatic and learning to understand the world so like through the inner um how can i say it through an a, a deep inner um, interaction with the world around us um and this is this is 
part of, and Adam Indersley describes it, this, this is an essential part in ego building or mind building. Having a mind in the out of window sense, it's like it's it's um it's of deep value because it's a way it's, it is an awakening, an individual awakening to it's like this uh, I consciousness. Um, uh, but this then has this 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 truth consciousness can't just be satisfied with it's like the materialistic. Uh, interpretation of what life is um, it, 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 it's like so a true scientific attitude well so let's say okay yep undoubtedly we understand so like the physical processes of the world in a way that was unimaginable for people like it just a, a, a it's like a, a few centuries ago uh, but that's not the end of the journey it's like you get the impression science sort of like thinks it is it thinks it's almost there it's a, it's a little bit like um what was it it's, um einstein's theory of relativity i mean it came about because there was this small uh un, unresolved issue with i believe it was the orbit of uh was it venus or mercury one of the two inner planets so like they, they select they broke the rules and this like this really bugged them and it led to like a whole it's like complete revision of like this newtonian physics worldview to it's like the time space model of einstein and so you just need these like subtle points uh so um, yeah you just need these these inconsistencies these things that don't make sense in the model and you look in them in depth and suddenly a whole new world of understanding explodes and that's where people like you and i are and it's like the many people out there who are looking for answers about soul spiritual questions which is not um is not talked about enough uh, and certainly religious institutions seem to be hopeless in my own experience i mean there might be exceptions there but um, in actual fact, I know there are exceptions. I shouldn't say that. But I'm thinking about it's like the large, it's like the, the Catholic Church, the Protestant Church, and the different churches. Um, there's there's a real hunger, a, th uh, a thirst and hunger for a deeper understanding of what is this life thing. And uh, these people, the the people, the, the priests, then often not able to give the flock what it needs and uh, they they come up and they they have these platitudes which are okay for some people but for other people they just become no this I, i'm sorry i can't believe that my i'm my critical thinking that says that that's um there's, there's too many contradictions in what you're saying for me to be able to accept that accept that as a as a basis for living my life yeah i agree with you on that it's very i have really found or able to connect with people in those kind of institutions, religious institution where they um, are actually talking about some of these ideas we are discussing. It seems more like another version of being on an autopilot, um, another version of program, religious programming. Um, there are a lot of concepts, um, but um, yeah, I've seen both versions of that in the scientific world as well as in the religious. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> in the religious world, it's called scientism, uh, and but there are there are lots of genuine scientists out there, just like in in churches that are also genuine seekers, and but there are other sociologists, followers, and yes, sayers. Now, now I'm seeing this new way of kind of on YouTube channel, being able to connect with some speakers uh, and explorers um, or, or thought leaders who are sharing these ideas. So we have kind of kind of created our own new wave in a way. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's, it is, it's, it's, it's wonderful, isn't it? I mean, it's, uh, I, I like trying to find like history points that are somehow similar to what you're, uh, what we're experiencing. And I think about it's like the revolution that happened when Luther it's like translated the Bible. It's like this, the Bible was available for a thousand years just as like a, a select few who, who read Latin. And Luther, he had this revolutionary idea. No, 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 no. Everybody should be able to read the same thing and come to their own, uh, their own opinions. And uh, in this way, this YouTube, despite 
censorship and the problems that are there with it. It's a fantastic platform for being able to have these type of uh, discussions and getting to know who these people are that seem to be well developed in uh, both describing uh, what might be going on and but also having a, a firm underpinnings like a conceptual framework in which all of these strange things actually do seem to make sense there's there is a logic to them uh, that's um, that's hugely important I think for people to be able to begin to sort of say hmm perhaps there is something there after all yeah it's um I'm really grateful for this opportunity of being able to connect with people uh, online otherwise um, it's kind of uh, trying to figure out figuring it out on your own by reading books um yeah and now i was gonna say and this is this has been one of those like huge learning events for me this year because i've been involved in a couple of groups studying a book together which i'd never done before i'd always like just like you were describing there it's like tend to it's like yeah i read these books and i might have the occasional conversation but i try to absorb content and make sense of it myself but um, we read a couple of the philosophical works of Steiner, the one that I mentioned before, The Philosophy of Freedom, but also um, another book of his called The Riddles of Philosophy, which is a history of the uh, development of philosophical thought. And that was really something quite special. Lots of people that had somehow, not all, all of them, all of them had an interest in philosophy. Many of them had an interest in Steiner. And that that really accelerated something in my learning process I think I took it more seriously but then having somebody to or a group of people to bounce ideas off of and but and also most importantly to hear their interpretations we're all reading exactly the same text Angus Angus interprets it this way Jeff that way Kate that way Jonathan that way and this is enriching to us as as human beings because um yeah all of these people can sort of like add in aspects that when you think about it, say, yeah, I can see why you would say that as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, really, that's been that's been a fantastic voyage uh, this year. And uh, if you ever get an out of windows like uh, study group going, uh, I'll, I'll join in there. <laughs> yeah, I'd be. I'm really interested in reconnect, redoing like group conversations because you, I, I agree with you. It's such an enriching experience, and you get yeah. so much out of it. it. It's kind of like watching movie with a group where each person is focusing on something else, where you would normally not notice, yeah. even not notice in a, while watching a movie. So it's very interesting when yeah. someone. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and, and it's. It, it, I think it's also really important this creating community around this this practice uh, in some of the people that I've got to know thanks to this is the you know you, uh, when you feel that you've got so like this same or a similar it doesn't have to be identical this uh, a similar basic understanding of what a human being is if you know that the person that you are sharing a conversation with, uh, talking to in conversation, you might disagree about like certain points, but they always have this backdrop. But it doesn't matter because, like in essence, like where it really, really, really counts, there, there's this sense of community. You know, we we are working even though we might be it's like in conflict in conversation, we understand that at another level, we're, like we're trying to flesh out our understanding of what's really going on here. So it becomes, it's like a critical feedback. It's constructive, uh, constructive conflict that leads to something, something greater. Yeah, and that's something I love about this work is um, having that okayness with, conflicting ideas um, yeah. that, that that's a good sign of stepping out of mind because it's mind is has a problem with 
conflicts and contradictions whereas when you step out of the mind um, contra um like it's especially when we are dealing with this kind of work um, there are so many contradicting ideas and um it's it's a very tricky subject to um explore so um and and that 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 is one benefit of when true eye kind of comes through where you you don't have a problem with conflicting ideas or contradictions it's it has it all has its own place in a way there's a wonderful part in Arabindo. I think this is actually, I, I had to reread my articles to remember what it is I wrote. Right? And there's one one phrase, he, he has this image like of a thousand rays, it's like unifying into one. Um, and I, I mentioned it in my first, uh, first article. But I think this is a beautiful image for understanding how we we can see the world from so many perspectives but as we begin to get closer to um to truth what we find is that what were seeming contradictions they are not they are um they have this they have this uh it's like this hegelian dialectic isn't it it's like your thesis antithesis and they um and and the synthesis where you begin to see things that seem to be essentially in conflict if you can t take find this third position you realize no, no no these are just on spectrum it's not they are they're different aspects of of the same thing and so as these thousand rays it's like converge they all converge into one this is the image that Arabindo gives which is also very similar to to goethe this idea that nature has created us for her own edification nature is growing us so that we can so like bask in her in her it's like utter amazing ability to to create so we can fall in love with her and so i think i oh got life it's, it's a good thing this <laughs> i did very nicely i haven't heard that before that's a good way yeah. to that idea. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I was. Um. I was. There's one thing you were talking. I don't know how much uh, time you want to dedicate to this. Um. But there was. Um, there's one. Yo. Yo. Good idea. Um. What? So Blavatsky. She's. She's interesting in the context of anthroposophy because, of course, Steiner was, he gave lectures in the uh, Theosophical Society for 11, 12 years, something like that. I'm not exactly sure, um, but it was actually uh, in 1912 that he decided to create uh the anthroposophical society because of what was happening in the theosophical society this was no longer you if i say something that's wrong because i haven't studied blavatsky that much but my understanding is that blavatsky died and annie besant and uh ledbeater was it thomas ledbeater i think it was they um they brought in this idea um that uh there was a there was a boy in the east and he was a reincarnation of christ and they were like they were promoting this as as like an essential truth within the theosophical society i think blavatsky had passed on by this stage um, and this was the point when steiner said no this is something i cannot uh, be a part of and but this this could be a topic for us like a conversation later today because it's huge it's absolutely huge but uh, um, what Christ was like represents in uh, in anthroposophy is one of the ways in which it is fundamentally different. Even though we've got like all of these commonalities going on there, it's like in, in on on the question of what Christ represents, it's absolutely different. And uh, I was reading a I was reading a lecture yesterday um and um it, it was really interesting uh and you 
you might understand the significance of this. I, I don't know because I don't know how, how deep uh, your, your reading is of uh, the Upanishads. Um, and and um, it's like Vedanta philosophy, which is at the root of uh, in there. But um, Steiner is basically saying that, uh, and, and not basically, he says this, this is almost verbatim what he says in a part of the lecture. He says that if you look at the Upanishads, and the being that is talked about as being Vishvakarman is basically the Christ being before it was in, before it was incarnated. Um, so it, what he's saying is that like in within Vedanta, um, you are if you when you begin to talk about Vishvakarman as like what it represents within that tradition. That is exactly the same being that incarnated, it's like in in um, uh, in um, was it called Palestine? In uh, it's like about two thousand years ago. But that being that's like pre-existed, that was incarnated, has also continued to exist afterwards. And this is it's like a central part of. Um, the central driving force inside the the impulse for freedom and a genuine spiritual understanding of what we are so to take to take a phrase from uh, uh take a phrase from uh, john the gospel of john um ye are gods and this is like this is out of the word uh, this is out of the mouth of christ saying uh, john ten thirty four, ye are gods um, and I would love to hear a priest, so it's like a, a mainstream piece of interpretation of that, but this is, this is what we are trying to become in the world of anthroposophy. This is the ro route that we are on, and it's this being Vishvakarma who gets the name in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, um, in Judaism as, uh, as the Messiah, and then becomes Christ in Christianity, but this is... This is all the same being. And notice how I'm using being and not process or archetype. This is a real being that's like seizing hold of world evolution. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's quite in that sense, the picture that he presents is very different from theosophy, although there are a lot of commonalities there as well. Yeah, that's a very good point. I, I'm also interested in um, I, I can see I'm a beginner student for all this yeah. work and I'm very interested in exploring uh, some of that. I, I know you discussed something about Trinity uh, recently on your blog. But it's, it, is yeah. that idea related to what you were just sharing? Yeah, it, it, so um, it, it is absolutely. Um, so it would be easy to think that the Trinity is a Christian invention. It isn't. <laughs> and Aurobindo is like describing perfectly how it isn't. Because when you dig into what the Trinity is, what's behind the word Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, what it means within it's like the esoteric church, not the exoteric church, not the church for the masses, but the, the church for the people that's like really take this seriously and investigate it, um, that it maps exactly, and this is what I tried to demonstrate in my last article, it maps exactly to what Aurobindo is talking about when he talks about the three poises. I'm just, I can't remember. It was when, um, well, was, I'm, I'm just looking up to see which, chapter it was it was when i was reading uh and it can't find the actual direct it was when he was talking about like the supermind it might there is a chapter called supermind so it might well have been in that chapter of the life divine but as he he talks about three poises or which are three ways of understanding the fullness of our relationship to the creator to uh, Satchitananda, Brahman, God, Yahweh, it, 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 the name doesn't matter, it's what it stands for. So in these three poises, 
uh, if you're already familiar with it's like a deeper understanding of what the trinity is within christianity you see that what Aurobindo is describing here is in uh in the vedanta they've got exactly the same it's like way of describing it's like the fun the essence of what uh life and existence is and it's not because so like these people got together and so like said let's make up some concepts it's like this is good science when you when you hit upon uh it's like concepts that adequately adequately describe the truth then then they then they spread um so it was what it, it i wouldn't say it was so much a surprise for me because i'm aware of the profundities or the profundities within the within the upanishads but to see it so like so succinctly expressed in three poises in one chapter of Aurobindo is like, wow, this is uh, this is really this is really beautiful. Yeah, it's fascinating. Some of these texts, how they capture um, large span of time uh, experiences in large span of time, so concisely. Like although when we are in it, it seems like random things and it's things are just happening but when you look uh, the way some of these um philosophers have captured it it's so um it's very um having a vision that's beyond just the, the current time span it's very interesting like um, if you also look from the time span of when jesus was born and um, when religion was um kind of at it religion and spirit was at it um, dominance at the time and how mm -hmm. all ideas faded away. We kind of entered from into deep into materialistic world, and now we maybe we are kind of seeing the some initial signs of um, all those ideas kind of fading away now, being questioned and uh, early phases of return to the non matter. Exactly, exactly. But all under our own steam so these aren't there aren't these huge institutions it's like compelling us to read the catechisms or, or whatever it is as it's not the dominant form of society we've got to make that like that individual choice that uh, i do believe there is a truth this truth consciousness lives in me and i'm going to do uh, as much as i can in this life just like take a few steps uh, in, in that direction um, yeah, and then, and yeah no 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 I, I, I would like to hear what you had to say there's no story or container for that return that's happening like for a long time we've been used to stories and containers to contain all of that but that's why it feels like chaos that's right but this is the interesting thing uh, people like Aurobindo and Steiner, they do give us that container. This is this this is the this is the real so like heart of it. That for those people that are actively looking, they find these people, and there's that they are starting to so like this 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 movement back upwards. They are beginning to see that it's it's obvious, and as they as they move like as they move back up. As, as like as the, the awareness of their own spiritual nature becomes more and more obvious and a, a real experience like in the every day then there's also this ability to connect back with the past as like recognize how what we're what we're trying to achieve now is something that was already there in a, in the past but at a less conscious level and this is the evolution of consciousness idea that so so key with these two thinkers that we are seeing to a certain extent we're not seeing anything new um in the sense that we are reacquiring it's like a certainty of spirit that existed um a thousand fifteen hundred two thousand etc like years in the past for them there was no doubt and we are moving back in that direction but not out of a, um, not out of this religious binding to something, but out of like an individual drive to understand the world more completely. 
it's very interesting to me because for a long time we've been so used to someone else coming and telling what's the truth like some scientist or some uh, president declaring that this is the truth but yeah. now but it would be interesting if this kind of transition happens where no one really comes out and declares that this is truth or anything but this transition is happening on its own so the, again so out of you know like they're, they're clear about this is an inevitable process um the only the th only thing that's not inevitable is who is going to wake up and who is not going to as it's like who's going to remain so like stuck in the material paradigm um so it's just sticking with the language of uh, of Arabindo. Supermind is an inevitability. It lives as a seed in all of us because it's our essential nature. The only thing we can do is stop it developing. We it's like we can stop feeding that that seed that's in us. Uh, and some people are doing that. They don't perhaps they wouldn't express it in that those terms, but because of what the content that they fill their souls with what they're doing is they are actually killing that scene or it's like making sure nothing ever develops of it whereas other people are waking up to it's like this this inner aspect and saying oh i have to feed this i have to find i have to find content be it written or on youtube or podcasts or whatever um that's where i feel these people are talking about what i know only vaguely at the beginning is also true for me. Yeah, and another way to look at it is rather than feeding that, because we not need feeding, but we are getting fed by the materialistic world, <laughs> like stopping that. Not, I wouldn't even say stopping that feed, but once we are done with that cycle of whatever trap materialistic world has to uh, has to get our mind engaged and get us um, kind of locked in that kind of um, uh, allure of materialism yeah, um, that's right. yeah. Yeah. Um, once that ha doesn't have any hold this is like a natural fallback you know in a way uh, because I, I, I guess like they can all cause exist where someone can engage with the, that kind of matrix in a way as long as they want to. Um, it can be, matrix can be very alluring and- uh, Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you and I know that we live in it, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah for different reasons perhaps they're past life reasons or perhaps we're just waking up in this life but we've decided to red pill ourselves and sort of like not be satisfied with the with the answers that are being fed to us by it's like the most powerful information institutions out there and saying no i have to i have to find something else now, once you're done you're done and then it's yes uh but at the same time it uh, is uh, this is where also why i think Aurobindo and Steiner are like of, of one soul in the sense that this isn't a rejection. We, we, we have to be very careful about falling into rejecting this. No, this is of value. Um, what we need to do is we need to recognize that value and, so like, and, and bring it into us. But all that which is not of value that's part of that paradigm that's what we like push away that's what we're oh, that's what we try to try to convert um into into something healthy because it's it's very easy in um and let's call it like simplistic religious thinking to demonize the other side and not actually recognize that it's like you need opposition or suffering as we we talked about so very briefly earlier is part of the learning path so we need this opposition is healthy it, it, it's healthy in the sense that this is good old Nietzsche isn't it it's, it's like what doesn't what doesn't uh, kill me strengthens me um, and materialism needs from my perspective at least and this is definitely Steiner needs to be recognized the value that it's creating 
uh, it's like, yeah, it's like, as this waking up to um, individual consciousness. But then once we've woken up to that individual consciousness, then in essence, materialism has done its job and we need to continue to function in this world. Um, and we need to continue to just like help the people around us and just like be a, be a decent, in my case, uh, father and husband and, and, and colleague at work. Um, but that doesn't mean buying into all the other materialist trappings that are part of that paradigm. And uh, we, we have, I, I, I feel like we have covered so much in this conversation, which is <laughs> absolutely beautiful, but as a more encapsulation for this conversation, and I'm asking this because I noticed um, when I was reading about you, you have done a lot of work in the AI and machine learning world. Um, so how does that fit into this curve of evolution that we are talking about? Because do you see that, that as like an extreme step forward into materialism or do you see that somehow finding it? Both, both. Uh, I, I, th I don't know. I don't know whether you were reading my thoughts or I was reading your thoughts, but I was about three, four minutes ago in conversation. I was going to bring this in because AI is it's like one of these. Uh, <laughs> it's the latest tool on which we've got to sharpen our awareness of. What do I mean by that? When you begin to engage with AI, and I'd love you to add to select your own comments because I know you work, or I've understood that you work in the world of computer tech, but I'm not exactly sure what, yeah? That's true. Yeah. So when you actually engage with this, uh, with ChatGPT to, to take an example, it's a, it's a very interesting experience. You know you're conversing with a machine, yet you still continue to treat it like you're doing so with a normal like human being or you can do you can choose to some people some people get abusive and, and all this type of things but it's like you, you can talk talk to it like a normal conversation partner i tend to use it as a research tool um but one of the things that comes across like very clearly is that the difference between so what pure intellect can create and that's what chat gpt and it is incredible the, the way this like the type of answers it can serve up i mean it is it's it, it's it's mind-blowing but at the same time it's real but it's how is that different from talking to a real human being Sometimes it's obvious because chat GPT um, like gets things very wrong and it misunderstands you. But then again, that also happens in normal conversation. Um, but sometimes chat GPT will outright, it's called hallucination, but I call it lying. Um, but as you learn to engage with what you know is machine, what you some of the questions you can ask yourself, I'll give this to give an example. So I was a bit intrigued after a month of using it as a tool. I thought I'd like to say, I, I said, to it, Thank, thanks for your help. And it came up with sort of like some line. I was like, yeah, it's, like, it's, it's, it's nice to be able to help. Or it used a feeling word. And I said, so I asked you the question. So have you been programmed to say it's like it feels nice? Or why do you say that? And then it goes on to say, oh, I can't feel anything and all this type of thing. So it's, it's, all of this is created out of probabilistic um, computations. So basically, it calculates the prob most probable next word that's going to make sense on the basis of the question. But it can also lead you to the question, OK, so when I'm speaking to a human being, when they are polite, are they doing it because they've been programmed to do it? Is it a purely intellectual fact faculty? Or is it because there's a genuine warmness of heart? And, and this is these are some, some of the strange slight like fruits of a conversations with chat, uh, chat GPT or AI is that you begin to see some of the fundamental differences between 
what intelligence can produce and what it means to be a human being. Um, and there are, there are a million other things that are interesting about AI, but I think in the context of our conversation, that's one of the things that struck me is like, what is our communication between one another? When is it like this, like algorithmic thinking almost? And when is it about something that lives, like lives in us in, 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 in the heart that's like causes me to act and react in a different way? Yeah. What would you? What about your own experiences in in that area? How have you? How do you relate it to, um, to your own thinking? I think it may open up. Um, eventually, it may open up recognition uh, of many different types of intelligences within human. Where even among human, we have so many different variations of intelligence. Where some people they are their intelligence is focused all based on the outer world, measuring the outer world and ideas that are present in outer world. But there is also other type of intelligence which comes off of an inner world, like inner processing um, and um, through dreams or through uh, just knowing um, artistic intelligence. Um, so, AI may have its own version of that because right now it's born out of um, the knowing world where a world that is knowledge based yeah. uh, and data based. Um, but if, who knows, eventually AI may be able to tap into the unknown world also. But that's one variation with the intelligence with the inner world. It's not tapped tapped into yet where mm. that world hasn't been explored as deeply as the outer world has been. I don't know, you're, you're a computer scientist, correct? Uh, I'm software engineer. Software engineer, sorry. So I was, this is, a, I had a conversation, he's a Brazilian guy, his name is Valdemar Setza, and he wrote a book called Artificial Intelligence or Automa Automated in automated what was it called automated it's not stupidity but it's something else let, let me um let me find the name uh, uh i'll carry on talking whilst i'm whilst I'm looking um so but the the fruit of this conversation it was a brief conversation which we're hoping to continue it was in that ai list that you might have seen on my channel there Valdemar said, so, uh, here we go, automated imbecility, artificial intelligence or automated imbecility. So he's, um, he's a, he's actually a computer scientist. Uh, he's about, I think he's about 75, 80 years old now, but it's like it's an amazingly sharp mind. And he was talking uh, as to why he is convinced, that doesn't mean he's right, but uh, he was talking as to why he's convinced that like um, artificial intelligence will never be able to achieve such certain things that are um, that are part of the human experience. And my way of one way of understanding that is the human being is much more than just mere intelligence, and therefore artificial intelligence can never. Um, th there is there are certain parts of the human being that an artificial intelligence will never be able to um, mimic. Um, uh, it, um, it might be able to, like when I asked the question, like it says, uh, oh, yeah, it, it makes me good to feel you happy. Well, I know you can't feel that's Those are just words you used. And I could, if I wasn't more critical in my thinking, I might like choose to believe it's true. Um, and he goes more into depth as to why he does think there are limits to what this intelligence uh, will achieve and this what's what's interesting from the perspective of this of this conversation is that steiner says the same thing um, in the sense that uh, intelligence is only one aspect of what it is to be a thinking human being um, 
this intelligence thinking back to that picture with like the thousand rays um, it's like coming together in one and as we as we get closer to it we, we sense like this this one great huge idea that uh, nature and life is um, intelligence is ex essentially is a dividing activity of the mind and as human beings we have the other faculty which in in philo philosophy is usually referred to as reason and it's the ability to to combine it's like these separate aspects that have been created by the mind into a whole picture. Um, and I think I'm right. Um, but when I, when I interview him next time, I'll have to ask him if that's, uh, that's his position. But I think that's my understanding of what he mean, meant by artificial intelligence. Well, it, because it, it, it cannot do that. It can appear to do that, but it's not doing that. Um, but I don't know. What, what, what do you think when you hear it described like that? Do you, do you agree, disagree, or different perspective? Some parts I agree because it, and also I also, to be fair, it's it's still in its infancy stage. It may uh, evolve and develop more. Yeah. Um, but when I use it every day, um, I use it as just like an alternative idea. I, I don't, I'm not able to really solve my problems using uh, chat GPT, but just for, uh, is there an, another approach to solve this problem more as an alternative? Um, but who knows, like eventually it may be able to do all of the things um, pertaining to general intelligence. I don't know that, but also in general, um, when we talk about intelligence, we uh, uh, in mainstream world, it only comes down to physical uh, world, but also that when we, if we add our um, other context of awareness and other layers of etheric layer um, or astral plane, uh, some people talk about encountering AI in astral plane. And um, so there are different versions, even in those planes of AI, where they are some of them are super creepy and some of them have um, an evolved version. So that's why um, it's uh, it's very interesting what's happening. But maybe, <laughs> um, it, maybe it will open up a conversation on what is really intelligence. Um, and for a long time, we have completely we have we don't even recognize inner intelligence it doesn't even have a platform in the mainstream world um, so if the outer intelligence gets dominated by ai um i i don't know if that would be a point where inner intelligence would be valued at that point there's some um... It, for, for me, as you describe it like that, it's leading me back to what initially got me going with Aurobindo and, and, um, and relating him to Steiner. It's this, what is knowledge? So, uh, it, it's, it, it, it's, it all comes back to what does it mean to, to know the world and what is, uh, what is this activity that lives in us, this thinking activity and that is getting to, to know the world. And as we as we approach that closer, um, this and the an instinctive feel, and that instinct is like then needs to be fleshed out. To, that the instinct needs to be tested whether it's correct. But there's an instinctive feel that no machines cannot do this because machines, the, this 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 activity of thinking that lives in us, this this. This thing that intuits concepts into us so that we then can understand the world outside us. That is not what artificial intelligence is doing. It's playing with numbers and spitting out words. And that's this is something fundamentally different. You have got this, what what is similar is like this black box notion. I mean, nobody knows what's going on inside these AIs anymore. It, not even the programmers, because 
we don't need to go into the details, but it's, it's a huge, complex and very interesting story around there. But nobody knows really what's going on behind there. You can go in and you can tinker around the edges and you can like put certain biases in it. That's that, that goes without saying. But nobody, not one individual, has a complete oversight of what's going on there. And th the parallel is with it's like us as individual human beings is we don't actually know where these intuitions in ourselves where they come from but we know they're not created on as like with a load of zeros and ones they're born out of something else so this the the origin of it is of a fundamentally different character um, and that's that's sort of like what's feeding my instinctual answer to there is a fundamental difference there and that no matter how hard AI tries it's it's going to only ever mimic but never be the same as thinking it's very interesting you say that just recently my friend Troy he was talking about this book Dune um, I, I I'm not sure if you have heard I, I know, I'm aware of the film yeah um, so in that book, he talked. Um, he mentioned about this concept of around the same time as AI was developing, uh, humans also uh, started evolving into a new species. Uh, so um, it it was kind of interesting uh, that there are these two kind of different intelligence uh, species kind of popping up, uh, and at some point AI get banned by humans. Um, mm -hmm. they so it's it's very interesting that these concepts were covered uh, in that book. Um, it's um, and yeah, it's it's an interesting activity that is oh, up, happening in um, in the outside world where I you see this we can see this type of AI opening up, but there is also this um, need for. Um, or a lot, a lot of people who are looking for this inner evolution yeah. to open up. Um, so yeah, it's it's fascinating to see um, it unfold. And there are so many ways it, it can go. Um, it's hard to say. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's, um, <laughs> I've just been watching um, How to Tame uh, Your Dragon 2 with my daughter. <laughs> And uh, so the, 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 the essence of one of the essence of the stories is if you have ga bad guys who sort of like have the alpha dra dragon that controls all the other dragons, then the world's in a bad place. If you've got a good guy, or a good mind, yeah, that's like controlling the alpha dragon, then the world can be in a good harmonious place. And I think the same is true for, um, for AI if it is people who are intent on destroying the world on dominating the world and taking away people's freedom if they're the people with the hands on the levers of these things or doing the programming doing that and doing the bias training that type of thing then humanity's in for some really dark times but there are also good people in the world who are trying to try to open it up there was like various like open source projects with with ai um if, if those people uh, in, in that community become dominant or strong enough within the community, then AI can bring a lot of good. Um, I, for some random reason, I'll, I'll say it because it came to my mind, but it's like initially they didn't even want any encryption on emails. And there was like a few passionate people, a, pe a few passionate people that were, it's like really so like insistent that's like, no, if you're sending one of these emails, then it just means like, the state can snoop on you. We're going to introduce encryption. So, so, so to for, for everybody, it's like there's a fundamental right of everybody to like have private conversations. I mean, that's all been eroded now. But this this is just like a mini example of how it's like how good people at the right time can like introduce systems that's like work against these forces that want to dominate and and control and um, yeah reduce us to. Um, slaves to their systems as opposed to free human beings free to explore um, and contribute to the world in their own ways yeah if, 
if that if it goes in that direction i think this path of freedom is <laughs> our option for freedom because if the, the freedom is not available in that pathway where it goes further into few people controlling everything uh, and making most of humanity replaceable uh, with AI. Yeah. Um, That's right, yeah. then this is the this is one of the few options to become free uh, this is it's the challenge of our challenge of our times every time has its uh, has its challenge this is yes another slight parallel here, here with uh, with both Arabinda uh, Arabinda and uh, Aurobinda so I'm getting, getting the name wrong Aurobinda and, and Steiner here is that there is they both talking talk about a dividing point in humanity again this isn't one point in time this is we're talking over it's like long phases of time but we are going to have it's like people who develop this super mind this completely different relationship to life and i'm not sure if arabindo states this explicitly but steiner certainly does and he says when so i need to so we reincarnate because incarnating has value for our own spiritual development but there will be there will come a time in which actually incarnating itself won't be necessary for the further development of the soul spirit um and this is this is always um it is this is like it's like a lot more like a, a distant idea it's not going to affect you and i basically oh, not in this life i should say not in this life um but it's like we, we we are moving towards the future as we do there's this clear idea within apostrophe it's like when we truly wake up uh, truly as it's like that this truth consciousness has become as like a far more uh direct experience it's like in our everyday life and this might mean actually it's like seeing elemental beings like seeing the spirit world around us this type of thing when that when we're there with our individual consciousness the body has in essence served its purpose for you and so it's a you, it's a little bit like this um buddha idea in a way it's I'm, I'm not equating it to buddha but similar in essence this idea no longer need to incarnate you might choose to incarnate and you certainly will want to like help those that part of humanity it's like that is still struggling with what you were struggling with in the past so that they can free themselves from the um from a complete transfiction with uh the material world um but this is this is yeah this 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 freeing aspect has so like in in, in the future it means that uh when, when super mind is achieved then uh, we then stand in a much freer relationship to actually even needing a body and i want to emphasize a free relationship that it we might choose to incarnate but it won't be sort of like a thing my understanding of uh, something that we will have to do for our own development because we've already achieved that goal that that part of our evolution of consciousness if i put it like that you're right i remember that about steiner now he talks a lot about this possibility in future um, of ai showing up and how that yeah. can be actually a deception i think um, i think he uses word Ariman or absolutely yeah that's right okay so this is another like huge <laughs> word in uh, in anthroposophy uh, but yes we basically just a very very brief description um we were talking about um demonizing the demons i seeing only what is negative about the opposing forces but what Steiner is really um focused on is he, he we have so like there are two two ways humanity can be tempted and each individual uh to that extent it can either be pulled down into materialism which is a denial of the spirit or the other other one is like this it's called lucifer in 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 anthropology the luciferic temptation which is the desire to not incarnate it's like to to lose your relationship to to earth so it's it's um 
I've heard it referred to as like spiritual bypassing. It's like out of pure ego, egoity, I want to escape the world so that I don't have any more pain and suffering. And this is like this is Luciferic. And this what there's there's this image that uh, Steiner created is like a wood carving. It stands about uh, about three meters high, I believe, of Christ as this central figure as the reconciling force between these two. We need materialism. We need the spirit world, but we have to find our our response responsibility as an individual human being is to find that healthy balance between those between those two opposing real beings that are trying to each one's trying to pull us in the direction and you've got this natural tension there as well uh, going on but uh, yeah man yeah. is materializing sorry go on. I, I thank you for explaining that 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 reminds me a lot about steiner's work that i i know um, forgot about uh, he and and Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I guess he also talks about this idea of, um, so in spiritual world, especially when if some if if one encounters uh, invisible beings or they think that they assume that it's advanced, but um, he I, I think Stein it's Steiner who points to like something uh, invisible beings they can exist in like super advanced level or even like super devolved level. Exactly. Yeah. Just because yeah. something is evolved doesn't mean it's advanced or evolved. Exactly. Yeah. This is a key idea because spiritually, most people are just like, oh, something is something beautiful. It's something we have to aspire to. Yeah, yeah. There's good spiritual and there's bad spiritual. And it's important to know the difference. <laughs> and the thing is with AI, I think just because something is appears to be super intelligent doesn't mean it's evolved. It may have its own agenda or it may do. It may be capable of doing intelligent thing, but it may end up in a mo more foolish states, which you don't want to be in. Um, and um, and that's that's why these concepts that we have in our mi mind, um, collective psyche, about relating, labeling things to like if something is able to do this, then it's that. Like all of these needs to kind of dissolve to be able to see things as they are. Yeah. <laughs> Because in that realm, all these possibilities exist where some some beings that are very silly could be empowered with a lot of power and intelligence. And at that point, you can use only your own agency to decide which is which. <laughs> exactly. That's right. So ultimately, you have to, again, it's like keying uh, into this fundamental concept of reincarnation i have to take the responsibility for the decisions i make and if i choose to like be a devotee of our man simplifying here that has consequences it is we don't need to make a moral judgment about it what we have to do is understand the implications for it's like our life what does it mean if i reject the spiritual what does it also mean if i reject it's like what uh, Adaman is like trying to contribute with, which is like this. This um, it, when Rada Aurobindo talks about the value of mind, so like this grounding experience, this it's like thorough investigation of the world as being an essential part of waking up to what we are essentially. That is in in anthroposophy. That is thanks to Adaman. So the demon is not like full on demon. <laughs> it's, it's, it's this. Um, it makes perfect sense, but it's not the way uh, the opposing forces are usually described in religious settings. And I was, I was pleasantly surprised how accurately uh, he Steiner described of some of the things that are popping up now. Like he, even the some of the words that he used, like this be this. Uh, Ar Arman would be born with um, out of like dead thoughts um the dead machine thoughts and that, that was it's so odd <laughs> to, uh, write these things so many years ago when that was not even that possibility was not even there so, yeah. and th this is uh, you've touched on another area of why i've gravitated so strongly in my life um to 
really digging into 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 Steiner because actually he leads you back out into the world. In I mean, so all the philosophers and all the so like the scientific papers that I've read are predominantly because he's 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 mentioned an idea. So I thought oh, I have to investigate it more thoroughly. He's not giving me anything in that area, but so I have to go and inform myself. Um, and I was going to. You, you said something important there that I, want, I was trying to follow up on, um, that it invites you out to understand the world. Yeah, but there is there's there's also an important aspect. You you get these uh, people can can come along and make bold uh, statements about what it's like the nature of the spiritual world and what we are as human beings. But Steiner does two things that are, are rare. One, he creates concepts that he invites you to fill in with content yourself. So it's not him defining how this world is. What he's saying is like, look at this world, look at the world. Uh, look at it more accurately, basically. And I, I'll give a quick example here. So, uh, so what would uh, a plant? Is it really just material? I mean, already just in a plant, you've got like many of the laws of the universe being broken. I mean, it's like the gravity. I mean, so it's, it's overcome gravity. Yeah, it shouldn't be able to do that because everything is returning to entropy. Yet in a tree, that's exactly the opposite of what's happening. You're getting meaningful order being created. Dead matter does not do that. Um, and so you don't need to be convinced about the existence of this word etheric, because when you're walking in the forest and you actually think carefully about what you're observing, and, and this is where he helps you. So it's like, consider this, consider this. And then you realize this isn't some abstract concept. This is something real that permeates the whole world around me. So this is one way in which he's extremely useful for somebody who's like trying to understand the world. He, 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 he creates these, like these, these black hole words. He, they're not fully black hole because he does begin to describe them, but the purpose is, is that we as individuals fill it in. We don't take him as a guru telling us this is the way you should understand the world. He says, no, you go and understand the world, but you might want to pay attention to this, 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 and this, and this, and then you'll come to a world conception that goes way beyond the materialistic world conception. So that's one way in which he's really interesting. The other way, which is what you were mentioning there, these predictions that he's made. So he, he's very consistent in saying that spiritual science will never be in conflict with uh, natural science because they're both describing reality. And so he actually, he's made loads of predictions. He, he doesn't, they're there in his lectures. Um, and you, you mentioned one of them. Um, and many of the predictions that he made, um, so is, especially in the field of science and astronomy, it's really interesting, um, have already been shown to be true. Others are like on their way to being shown true. I can select C and just give an example. Uh, if we <laughs> currently, if you're an astrophysicist, there is only really it, matter and gravity. That's all the universe is. And that, that'll explain everything. You've got to just like invent dark matter and to balance the equations and this type of thing. But in their minds, those are the principal forces working there. And Stein says, no, 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 it's not true. Um, and so if you begin to look at some, there's a guy called Walter Russell, and he he's not the only one, but he's in, at least in my mind so one of the best known ones he's got this electric universe model and uses so like electricity and plasma sheets and all of this type of thing in the universe as a model for explaining what's going how the world how the universe came into being but what's actually like keeping it moving 
And so for the last few years, I've been following a channel called Suspicious Observers. And one of the reasons I do that is because I recognize what they're doing is they're touching on an idea that I've already been introduced to with China that hasn't been fleshed out. And these guys, they're doing the real science and they're saying, look, this is what we're finding. This is what we're finding. And I'm going, so I'm loving it, like learning about the universe and what's going on in the solar system and the, the sun. And so like beginning to see how what Steiner was talking about more than a hundred years ago is being demonstrated to be true by like current uh, current scientists who are also fighting against like the the, the established uh, version of uh, like how the universe is born or how galaxies are born. Isn't that a channel that also talks about magnetic pull flip? Yeah, that's right. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes, they do. Yeah. There's there's a certain amount of scaremongering going on there, which I'm not so like, which I'm more ambivalent ambivalent about. But their research on uh, magnetic excursions and uh, magnetic or geomagnetic magnetic excursions, geomagnetic reversals, I think are very interesting. But more interesting from the point of Steiner is actually what is the sun. So, uh, and Shiner, he, he says, like, when the scientists finally work out what the sun is, they'll say, it's, it's nothing like what we think it is. It's not, it's not this big nuclear reaction that's happening there. It's something completely different. And in this electric universe model, you begin to, they're already moving in that direction, saying, so this, this, this nuclear, this idea, there's sort of billions of nuclear reactions going on in the sun, and it's like there's this infinite gravity in there. They're bonkers. They're absolutely. <laughs> you just have to look at some of the data to understand that it, the, the model just doesn't hold up. And going back to Steiner, what you just mentioned, another thing I noticed that's similar to Sri Arvindo uh, was, and this I was talking to my friend recently, um, uh, the, this idea from Vedanta on how real intuition is never separate from logic. Um, and if and if your intuition is not accurate, um, it it could be because of distortion. Um, and and that's why intuition is actually the highest form of logic. Um, and it seems like he talked about how Sri Arbindo kind of gets into that in the in his book. I I, I I'll have to. Do, do, do you remember where that was? I, I have, sounds, sounds interesting. I'll tell you what intuition is in Steiner's terms, but I'm interested in. What, um, could, do you know, was this in the life divine or was this in something else? I'm trying to find that um, because he mentioned that it's in uh, he that Sri Aurobindo kind of touches upon that idea of, of intuition and logic uh, and okay. uh, that. So this what he described about Steiner reminded me about if 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 he if he does speak about that in the life divine book, that would be super interesting. Another thing that another dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right. Um, yeah, so in intuition, yes. So I, I would, um, coming coming from Steiner perspective, intuition is we've got three slight technical terms: um, aspects of the super mind. And Steiner get divided up into it's like three areas, and it's like they're progressive in their understanding. So we've got normal. Normal day consciousness, which is slight mind in in Aravinda. but then uh, as we um, as we begin to develop our um, our spiritual awareness, we have uh, it's like the the next level of consciousness that begins to awaken in us beyond so like normal perceptual consciousness is something called imaginal or Im imaginative consciousness and again so it's like very 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 basic terms here but it's this idea that this other world this world of beings communicates to us with us through pictures um and so we we might feel comfortable it's like using the word inspiration but i won't use it here because that's the next word i'm going to use for the next step but so it's this idea it's like we get pictures coming to us and they feel as if they're full of 
wisdom or full of an impulse or full of an insight um uh, so this is this is like the the first uh step in the development and it doesn't always have to be a linear development either but these are three like defined areas then you've got um this uh, so the second level which is called inspired or uh, inspired consciousness um and it's this idea that instead of the um these beings expressing themselves in pictures they are actually able to communicate with you something similar to like the sound experience we have so it's a more intimate connection because let's just take an example i've never met you before we'll imagine so prior to an hour and a half ago or two hours ago i hadn't met you i had no idea the only thing i had to go on was like what you look like what does that tell me about you it tells me practically nothing it's only when you start opening your mouth telling me the stories of what you're thinking about your experiences it's like what's happening in life around you that's when i begin to get to know you at a deeper level and it's exactly the same relationship in the in the in the spiritual world when they can start communicating out of themselves they reveal deeper secrets that can't be expressed in pictures yeah um and then there's a final uh step which is called intuitive consciousness or intuition and this is actually where our i being is able to basically completely leave the body live in the other being for a while see the world experience the world as that being understand that person at or that being at a still deeper level and so like all the wisdom that is in that person and then because it hasn't lost its own consciousness when it returns back to its when it leaves if you like when it is no longer like living within that being it still has a, it still retains that understanding that knowing that it lived through whilst it was living in that other being that's in intuition <laughs> Thank you for going in depth in that. That's I had never heard that before. So it'd be really nice. Um, we've been going for quite a long time now, but I, I'd love to like pick up these these threads as uh, like at, uh, at some other time, perhaps. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I would love that. We can pick something specific and kind of go in the rabbit hole um, because yeah. there's to um, each chapter both Sri Aurobindo and Rudolf Steiner there's so much to um, discuss in, and so much to capture some of these nuances yeah and yeah, yeah me too it was, a, it was a real pleasure yeah I look forward to uh, look forward to again to doing this uh, sometime thank you thank so it's been lovely yeah. talking to you Suma uh, really thank really pleased you. we finally got to talk thank you so much Angus and if someone wants to reach out to you uh, after this, watching this video, um, can, should they email you or your website is the? Yeah, I'll um, I'll in I'll send you an email with links to. I mean, you've got my channel. If you just put uh, channel and uh, the YouTube channel and my it's like where I've written stuff. If you just put those in the show notes, that's okay. they they can contact me through there. Yeah. I really enjoyed this conversation. It was so much fun. Thank you. Good. Me too. Look forward to chatting again soon. Okay. Have a yeah. good day there. Bye.